when it comes to the professional football field, I have to try and destroy you. When you can fall in love with the process of getting great as opposed to just being great, that's where greatness becomes your reality. I've done too much work in the dark to lose in the light. I've done too much to not keep shining brighter and brighter. And the pathway to anybody's future identity that they want to attain or sustain is a very similar collection of actions, habits, and mentalities. You have to exercise them in the immediate moments, not feeling comfortable. But the more you do it, you'll eventually feel uncomfortable not doing it. And I had this moment where I was like, I want to be a great football player. So I started watching Jerry Rice and the guys in my area. Okay, well, they do these things where they go catch a football every day. I was like, but I don't do that. I guess they got to do it, you know? So 15, I've caught football 500 times a day. And eventually, because after seven months of doing this, became what I call effortless effort. And it was just this different human that emerged. I was not the same guy. That is the dark work, man. The stuff you do that's not sexy, not seen, it's misunderstood. People might ridicule you. Like I've made fun of for posting videos. What are you doing? Hey, you're a gym owner, bro. What are you posting videos for talking about life? I'm down the line 20 years from you. I'm financially at peace. Time, health, relationship-wise, I'm at peace with my wife and my kids. And that took a lot of freaking work. You have to take some super uncomfortable, bold actions. The question I have to you that I want to kick off with is yeah. you are all in on this thing you call dark work all in. and dark work is about like looking at the people who like dominate a field like the most competitive the yeah. most aggressive people like they've gone off and they've done this dark work but here's the question I have for you um, mm -hmm. who do you think is the most competitive person ever and why do you look up to them? Uh, well, I don't know if I look up to him, but I like how you threw that in there. Uh, I think the most competitive person I've seen that I enjoy to watch is, uh, is Michael Jordan. I like how he, it's, and the thing, it's not a competitive on the court. Like the thing is the thing people look at is like, oh, I'm Michael Jordan. But if you ever watched that, uh, I think it's the whole last dance documentary, there's ways that he was competitive with himself, competitive in his mind. Like before the games, I would talk, there's a certain swag he had and certain things he would state that are just alpha. Like he would, he was like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't realize it, but he's peeing on the floor next to you with the word he just said, you know? And so I liked that kind what of- What does that mean? He's peeing on the floor next to you. Cause you know, like a dog marks his territory, right? Okay. Yeah. And so he'll have statements. Like you can see, like there's a camera watching him. Like he walks in a room and like, there'll be a group of guys sitting there doing stuff. They'll kind of like say, I don't know. I can't recall the exact things, but he says these things that they all of a sudden you can notice. Like they kind of like the energy in the room shifts a little bit. Then he just walks on out. And it's like, he was like, without you knowing what he's doing, and maybe it's because I've been an athlete and I understand like the alpha mentality and what you say and how you say it around certain people, but it'd be him walking in and kind of pissing on the floor a little bit and then walking out. And you wouldn't notice it unless you've been in a setting and you go, I know what he just did. <laughs> like those are <laughs> athletes. We know what this man just did. And so I, I, you know, but the thing is to look up to him. I think I admire those parts of him, but I don't know if look up to him like, oh, I got to be like this guy. I don't know if that's the case. I'd love to shake his hand. It'd be cool, but I'm not going to go out of my way to go find the guy. Uh, but no, I do respect that manner because there's certain parts of you talk about identity where that is necessary to express that part of your identity, but that's not necessary to express everywhere, right? That was very well expressed and it worked perfectly in basketball. But if I took that home, was like that with my wife or with my kids, wouldn't work, right? So I, I, when you say look up to him, I look at the whole person and I don't know if the whole person's a person I would look up to. It's interesting that you parse that out. I love The Last Dance, the ESPN documentary that you yeah. can watch. Uh, I don't know what platform it's on. Netflix, I think. Um, but I just call it the Michael Jordan revisionist history show. <laughs> like, like it is so... I think he's an executive producer on it, but he and he's very transparent and it's cool, but it's basically like... Like, hey, Michael, why don't you go ahead and set the record straight from your point of view? <laughs> Did you get that feeling or no? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what it is. Because I think there is that thing where it's his quiet way of making it clear who he was. Because in this age nowadays, you think about most of the greats at something, the dominators of their whole area. It was like the foregone times. And the only people really telling the story is those who experienced it in the time. You don't get a chance to really tell your own story. And so he's able to... Like Joe Montana doesn't have one of these. He's you know, one of the greatest football, American football players. You know, you don't see um, yet uh, a Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo, or like a Lionel Messi. Like you don't see them doing it. But I think there'll be a point in time when these things have to come out 20 years from now and people have a debate about the new person. Oh, and Lionel Messi just got signed for a cartoon. Did he? About That's his funny. life and his childhood. Yeah, they're doing some kind of like kids show or something because I guess he came from uh, poverty. Probably I, like, I don't know. Do. But those are necessary oh. because then they allow the debate 
to to be genuine. I think that's it. It really, I think that whole thing messed up LeBron as the greatest like whole idea because then you get to actually juxtapose the energy of how LeBron competes and dominates versus the energy of how Michael competes. Because when that came out, you got people talking about like, no, it was legitimately like a scary. It was scary to know that Jordan's coming to town. Like when like they said when the schedule would come out. Literally, they go and look and say, okay, where is Chicago so I can get my mind ready at the beginning of the season of 82 games? You know, like, so there's like this way that he presents himself to where when you get that like full embodiment of him through other people's eyes also in this setting, you go, oh no, there's no way, there's no way that LeBron's the same. <laughs> like, it's, there's no, like, he's a different animal of a human. And so I think it's cool mm-hmm. to see how that is played out in the new age of how people maintain their greatest status. In Phil Jackson's book, uh, 11 Rings. So, so for those people who don't know, Phil Jackson was the coach of the Bulls and then he left the Bulls. Uh, it, he left the Bulls because he was kind of fired. Mm-hmm. And then that's when Michael retired because Michael said, or from the Bulls, because he said, I'm not going to play if Phil Jackson ain't there. Yeah. And then, uh, he went off to the Los Angeles, um, <laughs> dude, I don't know anything about sports. The Lakers. He went off to the Lakers, and oh, yeah, still, uh, yeah, still did. Bill yeah. Jackson went to the Lakers, and he mm-hmm. put together another championship team. Yeah, uh-huh. but it's interesting how revealing he is because the things, you know, as he was going through and put together another uh, uh, three peat, right? Yeah. Like, so he did the he did Dominant. three champions back to back with the Bulls, and then Michael's father died, and he went off to play baseball, and then there was a strike and whatnot. And then he came back, and they put another three together. Then he goes off to the Lakers and he puts three more together. And then they do another three run, but then they lose that 12th championship, which is why yeah. he has 11 championships. But mm. as he starts to get deeper in his career, in his book, he explains that he didn't quite realize or maybe quite respect the glue that Michael Jordan was to the Bulls. Yeah. Because early on, before Phil Jackson came along, uh, Michael Jordan was winning in every personal way. Like he, you know, he had the most shots, he or whatever, most baskets, most scores, all of that stuff. But yeah. but the Bulls weren't good because one person cannot win a game alone. Like True. he can't, he can win every personal thing, but he can't carry the team. He can't be a leader. And he had it took him a bunch of years to not only get, I think, the leadership around him and the coaching around him, but then for him to realize that it was his responsibility to not only carry the team but give the team an opportunity with the triangle and with other things yeah, to be yeah. able to uh to play a more leadership role. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing too. We talk about the way that uh that like because you talk about dominating, right? It means to rule, to govern, or to control, essentially. Like so when he like you can dominate like a morning routine or meditation, but he used to dominate in the game. But it's also like you said, the team, he would set that the way he competed to where he was a dominant character in his own right. But then what he did is when you're dominant in your own right, and you can look at a man next to you and go, hey, I'm challenging you to level up to my level. That's how you raise a team up. And so like you also say, what I admire about that person, like the way he competed was, he did at a certain point. Like if you watch the way uh, people talk about, like he'd, he'd get on you in practice. Like they're like, he would dog you in practice. And I get it because in football, that's how you have to be. Like I have to be able, when I play professional football, I have to be able to go to practice and look you like, let's say before practice, we could eat breakfast together. We could hang out and watch film, do our thing. But when it comes to the football field, I have to try and destroy you. That is my, that's my one thing. I don't care if we had breakfast. We're not your I, teammates, right? Oh, yeah. Your teammates? Oh, 100%. And I have to go after that and go like hang out with you and your family, right? I'd go meet your wife and your kids right after practice, after choosing. Okay, here's the thing. If I don't try to destroy you, then you aren't going to give your all which means that I won't give my all. As individuals, we don't get better. As a team, we don't get better. And football is a very alpha, it's an aggressive game. I'm going to go fly to your town and your arena, we'll call it, or your stadium, and go play against you as a grown man and physically grab and push and tackle. Like, I got to find, that's got to come out of me. It doesn't happen on game day. It happens in practice. I will practice at a certain level and I'll play at the level I've practiced. And so you have to be able to do that in practice. So I understood what it meant to be able to go into practice and like, I still care about you as a human, but as soon as a whistle blows or the snap goes, I'm trying to take your soul from you. Like not like hurt you physically, <laughs> but I want to make you look bad. I want to beat you in the play. I got to outrun you. I'll be, I got to make you look bad. Now the NFL it's worse because the NFL it's like someone has a job. Somebody doesn't. So if, if I'm nice, I'm going home. <laughs> I don't get to play at all. So I got to make myself look good to beat you out. It's just the name of the game, but you play it understanding what it is. And there's no, 
no disrespect within. It's actually respectful to come at that level, respectful of yourself and your own duties, but also respectful to, to make that man level up. So your team feels like you've elevated the team also. How long did you play in the NFL? I got hurt in my third season, tore my left shoulder. I like how I said, I like how I asked how long you played and you responded yeah. with, I got hurt. Like, yeah, like well, that's some like uh, it's, professional it's tough, athlete code for like, listen, man, I would have played 10 years and been an MVP if too. I hadn't been hurt. Well, I mean, a lot of guys could have played. I'd have a Super Bowl ring quite possibly if I didn't get my shoulder torn that year. But it's like, I just said, I got hurt in my third. So I don't have to go the whole conversation. I've played three years and then I retired. Why'd you retire? Because I got hurt. So just to say... I got hurt. Thank you. <laughs> Listeners understand now that Trucks is a podcaster too. He's like, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and jump ahead. <laughs> yeah. Help you out. There you go. And, uh, and so what was the greatest lesson that you learned in those three years? Oh man. There are a lot of lessons. Cause I've heard you share a story from the stage that I don't think I've heard you ever say any other time, which is the story of getting cut, um, getting cut and then having to train or having to try out for another team like right away. But I yeah. don't know if that's up there in one of the greatest lessons. There's a bunch of lessons and moments. And I mean, there was a situation where I got called in to, so I, fresh rookie year, my freshman rookie year, I got cut by the Buccaneers, like the second to last guys or like the last wave to get cut. So I went home and I was at home for, you know, I think six to seven weeks before I got a call. And then that six to seven weeks, I was kind of just hanging, man. I was kind of like lifting weights and but I wasn't really training. And then I get a call to go out week eight to the Seattle Seahawks. Now, typically you have these workouts. And there's other people there. They flew just me and one guy in a D lineman for a different position and a linebacker. Now, in this moment in time, I didn't get what it meant. Now I understand fully what it means. When they bring out six to eight guys, they're just going to see who's available. And one of those guys might make it later on. When they bring you out, they need a spot filled now. And they're hoping you're prepared. They're only doing this as a formality to make sure you're in shape to sign you. So I got there. I screwed the pooch, man. I don't know to explain. Like, I, I like we're doing the drills and it's rep after rep and they repeat you. They want to see if you can run. They want to see what kind of shape you're in because it tells them a lot about who you are. Have you been preparing? Are you geared up? Are you, is this your, is, do you love this, right? Is this your thing? Because your body and your shape will show. So I remember by like the back end of the thing, I was just kind of like doing my drills and backpedaling. And, and like I was- So hold like, on, describe for me like what this means doing drills. Like like they're like blowing a whistle and they're having you yeah. just like sprint hundred yards or what are you doing? Oh no, so picture a guy, you know, I'm facing, there's a guy with the ball, we'll say, you know, at the goal line and he says hike and he's directing me with like, you know, back sh backwards or shuffle or, you know, backwards run and forwards. But he's moved, he's directing me with the football. I'm reacting to it. Okay. And you go for it. And I'm talking, it's violent, full speed motion. If you're not going fast, they start over. The idea is to get your legs to get full of that lactic acid and see how long you can move. And then what happens at that point? And then what happens? You do it. Can you throw the ball at you? Can you catch the ball? Run through the line? Go do it again and again. And while it doesn't sound like much, you take two or three of these reps and you are gassed. I mean, you could legitimately like not move. So for me, I think two or three reps in, my, my, I hadn't been moving. I hadn't been teaching my body to keep doing the football motions. So I'm moving in quicksand or in sand. Like <laughs> I, I'm catching the ball. I can't get my legs to move and run through. And so I'm just slow out there. And after about five or six reps of doing this, I kind of breathe. He goes, let me give you a little breather. I took a little breather because I go again. We did it again. A couple reps that I'm, I'm dead again. Like my legs are shot. My lungs aren't that great. And his only statement was, he goes, I wish you're in better shape. And then he coach walks out the field. I get the flight and I go home. And that lesson to me was this thing. It sounded like, oh, no big deal. No, I, I could have had a job playing linebacker for the Seattle Seahawks way early in my rookie year when they were balling. And on top of that, who knows if I play there for 10, 15 seasons, all these, all these could have, would have, should have, but that little moment. And so I went home and I talked to my agent. He's like, I don't know what you were thinking. He's like, but that will never happen for one of my athletes again. Here's what you do. And he told me a whole regimen what to do. And so I maintained. And from there, I was good. I played another couple of years. I got signed later on that year with the Redskins. But the lesson I learned was like, life is going to present you with an opportunity before you know it's going to be there. And you've got to be ready for it by doing stuff now, disciplined now for the thing you can't see later. Because you don't want to have that pain of regret. That they say there's a pain of discipline or the pain of regret. For me, I wasn't disciplined. And I have the pain of regret to this day thinking about that little moment. So I do not want to experience the pain of that. So I choose the pain of discipline. I choose being on top of things, being ahead of the curve. Like I want to be on almost all the time. I schedule myself because I don't know what's going to happen or come across my plate six months from now. But I don't want to have that feeling of six months from now, it shows up and I go, I'm not ready for it or it passes me by. So that's Ooh. a football lesson taught to me 
that I've applied to life in many ways. Reminds me of Schwarzenegger. Um, you know, when he first came to America, and that was his goal: America, America. I want to go to America. Mm-hmm. And he was in. You know, he left Austria. He went to Germany, bigger area. Um, he got invited to the UK, and you know, was able to win, um, win whatever one of those Mister Universal, Mister Olympia, one of those things. Yeah. And then through that, he got invited to come to Miami for the big American show, like the big Universal one, and he had just won like one of these competitions and he's like in four days i'm going to be great but over those four days you know he didn't have his equipment he was staying in a hotel or someone's house he's eating he says he's eating fish and chips um he gets there you know he's not he's not used to the language he's not used to the audiences um the culture's different Mm. you know he's just does his thing but he knows deep down he's going to win this thing because he he is the best and he comes in second place and he goes back to his hotel room and he cries and he breaks down and he thinks he's the worst and his life is over, his career is over, everything's over. And the next day he realizes like, oh, this was my fault. I, I didn't, I could have trained more. I could have figured things out. I wasn't prepared. Yeah. I was coasting. Yeah. Um, for him, it was only four days, but he vowed like, I will, he's like, I will never let that happen again. Yeah. And we need, them. I think men we and women humans we need that level of loss it sucks to have the experience to teach you more but then i think had i not learned that lesson for sure i would have missed so many things that get me the stepping point if you're being on your podcast you know like there's definitely little you know quiet um hard to find moments where that mentality from the lesson i learned at that level was it was a cheap lesson which is good it didn't it wasn't an expensive one thankfully which means i didn't lose something later on in life that well it probably was expensive because i would have been paid like five hundred thousand dollars for the year <laughs> if i'd have been there but anyways the idea is like you would have been rookie of the year you guys would have won yeah, a super bowl all that stuff yeah no probably not that stuff you paid well in the nfl though but it's this thing of like it, it could have been something and so now in my life later i i don't have to pay the dumb tax i've actually learned a lesson and so yeah I mean, it applies my son's doing this right now my oldest son he's in college and he's always got to the point of like, he's a last minute guy, school with the last minute, class at the last minute. So he got to the, he's now done. He has this, he's trying to finish off and hopefully get a grade he really needs so that he doesn't have to lose his academic scholarship because he got a 2.9 something as opposed to 3.0. He has to get to maintain it. And I go, dude, this is ridiculous because he's now learning the situation of this, what he's in. And I go to my wife, he needs to have this loss. Like, I don't know what it's going to turn into, but as a man, his 30 year old self needs his 18 year old self to learn this lesson this hard way. Because if he has to learn this at 30, 35 with a wife and kids and a career, it's going to be more of a problem. It's going to be a heavier weight. So I'm I'm kind of glad he's doing this, if it makes sense, because you need this to emotionally connect to the problem of what it is later on in life. And so how does this, how do you use this today, right? Like, you know, you said that you still regret that way back then and you make sure that you show up uh, as aggressively as you can. Um, I've come... I've gotten to know you a little bit better over the last year or so, but how do you use this today in business? Uh, How do you use this today in your life as a man, as a husband, as a father? I think it plants this quiet driven like seed, you know, it's, there's always that subconscious, like, like a little energy you have, you know, that sometimes it's lazy, sometimes it's hyperactive. And I can sense and notice that I may not have actual words with it, but I know when I'm falling behind, I know when I'm not operating at my tick, I know when I'm just chilling, I know it. And then, if I'm smart, I'll listen to it and go, I got to level back up. I got to get back. So I'll like find myself, okay, what's going on? I feel off. And I go, oh, it's because I haven't done my schedule the last two weeks. So I'll find like a little pocket of time and I'll sit down, I'll lock that bad boy back in and I get going, right? I can sense it and I can feel it. But I know that little monster is, he's still the remnants of those moments. He's a remnants of that thought of, hey, the, when you were in that moment, this would have felt like, you know, because, you know, you were chilling. You're feeling like that again. You're not at that ticket where you typically are, which is what you felt past that or you felt the last two, three years. So when I hear that and my body goes, oh, I'm big chilling, like time to get back on. I just, I go, I don't even always know a hundred percent what it's for, but I have had moments where I'm going, oh, I'm so thankful I got that done. <laughs> like if I didn't get that done, <laughs> I'd been screwed, you know? But I think it's, if you talk to the idea of uh, the dark work I talk to, that is the dark work, man. That's the stuff I do that's an alignment because I think that little voice I'm hearing is Anthony, you're out of alignment. That's what I think it is. And I think we all have that voice somewhere comes in and goes, Hey, uh, you're out of alignment and you can listen to it and go, ah, no, I make a good excuse to, to stay where you're at. Or you can go, yeah, I am. 
It's not who I identify as. It's not the identity I believe will have the goals that I have or they won't sustain what I have. So therefore, I need to make sure I get back in line and do the dark work to get in alignment again with the identity that I know I am or that I aspire to be. And so it's a good, I think for me, those lessons where it trickles into today is like just, uh, it's like that little gnawing voice in the back of my head that I know sits there that I listen to and it informs me of when I'm supposed to do the things I'm supposed to, but it also is, I think it fuels my dark work. It fuels the things in the background that give me that sense of this is who I am. So when I step into the light, I'm not pulling from, I did this last night. I'm pulling from, I did this the last two decades and this last, you know, 15 years. 10 years. I've been doing this. So when I step on a stage or I step in front of the world in some manner of light, even if it's just me stepping out to, I don't know, coach my son's football team, whatever it is, there's something that comes behind me that gives me the charisma, the confidence that people think that's like, oh, it's just you develop this skill set. No, it's it's oozing from the years of things you didn't see I did in the dark. That's why I stand with confidence and I have a, I can look you in the eyes. If I know I didn't do it, or I know there's some part of me that I've let myself down, that also comes through. It comes through as weakness and timidness and a lack of confidence. And I can feel that. I can, it's, people can smell it like we're animalistic in that aspect. So I'm doing those things to make sure that what oozes out of me is a stuff of confidence. I think most people, though, you know, don't want to put in the reps. You know, like um, my wife is someone who, wants to be unique and wants to be different. And um, I don't know if you've heard of the Enneagram before or not, but uh, she's a number four. And number fours uh, want to belong. The biggest challenge is they never feel like they belong because they kind of always feel like an outsider because at the same time, they want to be very different and very unique. Mm. So how can you be, you know, special and yet belong? And um, when it comes to like developing a skill or developing a talent or really shining, um, you know, they have to, they struggle with the idea that before you can be exceptional, you must be average because being average is like, oh gosh, you don't like, she doesn't want to be average. I don't want to be average. Like a lot of people don't want to be average, but especially for her, she's like, I don't want to be average. I want to be exceptional. Yeah. But how when you're you... starting something new, man, like you, you can't like, like I, I, I want to go straight to exceptional as well. I just want to naturally be good at it. <laughs> You know what, what I mean? Be, yeah. What would be your gauging of a set? If you didn't go through average, how would you know you're exceptional? You know, like you, you have to have that. I just want to be awesome. Like for me, myself, I'll speak for myself even. I just want to be really good at, like, I want to be really amazing at things out of the gate. Like, don't we all, <laughs> don't yeah. we, don't we want to crush everything we try effortlessly? No, man. <laughs> would you want to open a puzzle box that already be put together? Oh, no, dude, that would, Oh, there's no fun in that, right? There's no fun in that. That's the idea. No. And I think you can actually be exceptional and belong if your exceptional skill sets are utilized or appreciated in the setting that you're in. Like if I'm in a a team of people and they need a specific person to something unique, like hell, I belong now because I'm unique, right? You can find those two to overlap very well in a lot of parts in the world. But I think there there is something like you're saying, there's a desire. I think the lazy in me wants to go, I want to be great out the gates. Right. But I've fallen out of love with that guy to a high level. I like the work, man. I, uh, not to say that I like subjecting myself to soul draining, you know, I can't breathe kind of work all the time. It's a whole different level of energy expelled, but I do enjoy the, I enjoy the process of learning and trial and error. I think it's because for me, years and years ago, I stopped identifying as the outcome, which is what you're talking to. I want to be great at this. And I started identifying with the efforts because if I identify with the efforts, I've already arrived. I am phenomenal at giving the effort. I'm phenomenal at doing the works. So your wife can be and you can be phenomenal at, at doing the thing to try to learn to grow. You can be phenomenal at that. And that within it is your exceptional skill set because most people don't do that. I don't think that, and it's interesting. I think you said, but how people, do you love, how do you see? Okay. I, yeah, I just want to pause here for a second. Let's do that. I, I went and did a weigh in this morning with one of those really fancy scales at the gym, yeah. you know, the ones that have like in, the impedance in and all of this stuff. Yeah. And, I didn't like the numbers as much as my cheap scale. <laughs> yeah, right. My cheap scale was much nicer to me, um, but that's cool. Uh, let's be objective, right? At least I know what, like my body percentage fat and all of that stuff. But, yeah. um, you know, the coach was asking me because I work out pretty aggressively and I said it kind of in jest, but it's true. I said, well, listen, like if I'm not nauseous or struggling to breathe at CO2 max, I know I'm not pushing my hardest. Now, I still give myself recovery days and I still take it easy sometimes, but I know in the back of my mind, if I'm not struggling to breathe or dizzy or nauseous, 
I have not pushed myself as hard as I could. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, yeah. so when you say that, it's, it's like anything short of all out feels a little lazy to me, doesn't it? To you? No, because there's so there's mentalities actually that go into. Matter of fact, there's a guy just now he set the open four hundred national, like the world record, the, the world lead right now for the open. No, oh, might have been the record. She might have been the world record for the open four hundred. And his actual statements where he said, it's crazy. Most people think that you have to run and train at maximum all day long to meet that. And it's interesting is I don't fully agree with that, but I agree with the science behind it. And here's the interesting science behind some of the ways people train. There are people that train their athletes specifically at sub max to increase their max. And in fact, most people do this. If I go and train my son who's in the garage with his buddies right now lifting, we trained. There's an actual maximum weight that they can all lift. And you would think if we want to get strong, what your logic would say is we'll go every day and lift that weight so you can push it faster right? or push it more. Because if not, you, you're never going to push more than that. No, but you can actually train a sub max to a tiring level that will increase the ultimate max. So if I go and say, okay, well, 50% of 100 pounds, whatever's max, 50%, let's say it's 50 pounds. Well, if I want to be able to move 120, if I can look at what's keep, let's see, what's the amount of reps I can get at 50 pounds with a hundred pound max. Well, I can do six. Okay, great. So if I was able to do from six to maybe eight reps, would that increase my ultimate, you know, overall max and actual the numbers is wood. So if I went from 50 pounds, which is sub dying, not the full mate, right? 50 pounds from six to eight reps, you'd see my actual overall max goes from about hundred to maybe 110 and it keeps going up. So you can actually train at sub maximal efforts and allow yourself to increase and grow like physiologically. But part of it is, I think there's this part of us that goes, what, I ask this question, what are we comparing that to? Right? Why are we comparing? Because for you to go, why, well, if I'm not doing, I'm not doing great. What are you comparing it to? Like you comparing it to being the world-class level? Compared that to- I, I just know that I haven't pushed my max. And so this isn't um, a physiology point of view. I know the importance of recovery and all that stuff. I'm talking more like the yeah. mindset. I'm talking more like, like, because where we, where you were going with this is like, I focus on, I like, I focus on the effort, not the outcome. But I know what my max effort is. And I yeah. know that I'm hardly ever operating at max effort. And so I always feel like a bit of a lazy ass. <laughs> well, then that's the thing is, here's a crazy, as much as it's a physiological, it's also a psychological thing. We have a decision thing. We call it the, it's like, I think a decision making tank they'll call it's like a, you know, there's some actual language behind what we call that. But there is a, a point at which your brain can't do anymore, right? And again, I don't know if, if running that thing to the edge all the time is going to be the thing that pushes it. I think there are going to be definite moments where we have to find ways to utilize the, what we have in times where we have to push 15 more minutes, 20 more minutes, 30 more minutes, right? But I also realize that I think it's, it's something to have the ability grow, but also I think you're looking for what I look for. You're talking about is a pride point of it. Like I've done everything the hardest before I get that pride and I dig out, right? I don't think that you have to have it every single time you do something, you know? I think the <laughs> point in time when you need to push it, like you know, and I know when you needed to give your all but didn't, but it's me doing it every single day, like a David Goggins kind of level, like, is that necessary? I don't think it is. Now, if you get to a moment in time and you're tested and you fail, then yes, you should have pushed yourself at a hard level, but now you have a measuring stick. You have a gauge of like, okay, I know how that felt. I got up this because here's a cool thing that we're not even talking about. Whatever your max effort and like your actual right max, it's relative to you. You might find that there's someone who could do double what you do and you, your absolute maximum is them going like, that's lazy, bro. What are you talking about? Right? So it's figuring out how does that compare to the life you choose to live? I was having a conversation in the garage a minute ago, one of the kids' dads, and I was talking about my kids and, you know, be 40, when I'm 44, I got an empty nest. It's like, I'll be 52 and I have an empty nest. And I go, I've learned in life that at the end of the day, there's certain levels at which you push and pull, which got back from Japan. It's super chill there. And I go, really, when I'm there also, no one knows who I am. <laughs> there's billions of people have no clue. So why am I pushing so hard at home sometimes? Why do I got to be the guy and do this stuff, right? And I go, I think it's a matter of just figuring out what your level is and going, that's my level. And I know what it may take to get to the next tier. But I could also go, if I don't, if I don't really want that, then it's okay to say, this is what I like. This is the level I can operate. This is, and so then you don't actually have to operate at tip top max all the time, right? It's not a, it's not a badge of honor. You killed yourself every day. Like it, it's something where my son, this is how this, I'll end on this, this conversation point. 
My son right now is in college and he's struggling. He's struggling to figure out how to balance and do all this discipline. Point nine, you've mentioned. <laughs> yeah, but we had this conversation. I told him, I said, son, right now it feels heavy to you. I go, and we were actually in the hotel in Osaka having this conversation like 48 hours ago. And I was like, you got to realize like there's going to be a point in time when it's not this hard. But if you don't figure this out now, you're not going to get any of the things that you want most in life. I said, right now, the life that I live is hard for a lot of people, but it's easy for me. I have found a groove in which I feel comfortable. I feel confident. I can flow. I can maintain this. And that, that's good for me. Now, somebody else might want more. They'd look at me and go, you're not doing enough. But I know my level, son. I said, you have to realize that there's going to be a point in time in your life when you get to a point and go, you know what? I like this life. I can handle this life emotionally, mentally. Like This is the level of life I like. And you'll have the strength so much above that to where it feels easy to you. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I said, this is the time for you to build that muscle right now, son. So you, gotta, you ain't me yet. <laughs> like I'm, I'm down the line 20 years from you. But I said, you're in the stage of building that muscle. Build the muscle, dude. Just build the muscle because later on, you won't have to flex it so much. You mentioned you were in Japan. And for our listeners, uh, like Anthony literally landed like two and a half hours ago or something. <laughs> yeah, about four, four hours ago now, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so we are talking fresh off the. Uh, fresh, I was gonna say fresh off the boat. Is that insulting? Maybe I, it well, is. well, that's why I said plain because I don't know. I think if you use it in uh, reference to people in that manner, it would be it'd be pretty bad. But I mean, yeah, we're good. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a lot of private conversations. Or anyway, uh, <laughs> but you mentioned it's different culture over there. One thing I love about travel is, um, like, I take. I'm off to London. Uh, tomorrow with my wife. And so I like, I buy a notebook for each trip because it's just like, as soon as I unplug from phone and from email and from all that stuff, and then in a different culture with different things, it's like ideas, um, clarity, like, like what hit you this week being in Japan? Cause, cause that I've admitted to you, that's one of the places that I desperately want to go. Um, I think it would be so, so cool. So what were the aha things for you being in such a different culture from America? There's a bunch. I love the toilets because I can, uh, they're all heated and they shoot water in your butthole. (laughs) I just talked about like, I like I expected all of these breakthroughs and these moments of clarity and what's important in life and value (laughs) and all of this stuff. And you mentioned the toilets. Yeah, bro. It's dope because it's it's sand on the toilet. You can just sit there like it's hot when you touch it. It's like, oh, you just hang out there. And then you just get up. I don't know. Anyways. So, uh, you know, here's the thing. I, I did notice that there, like, I think I'd mentioned a moment ago that there's like this, you're out and about, you're walking. No one knows who you are. When they talk to you, they think you're stupid because you don't talk their language. And then you start realizing like, how important do you really think you need to be or are in the rest of the world? And when I have that moment, I go, if no, if they don't know who I am, and I've worked this hard to be this name and people know me, my, you know, it's like, no one knows who I am. I was like, do you really have to work that hard? And what are you working that hard for? And it doesn't make me slow down anything in the near terms. But I look for the future of stuff. I genuinely settle back into even more that like, hey, this is all about the people around me, man. The people I get to spend time with. Can I facilitate by the revenue I make, facilitate experiences and memories and things that I love with the people I love? Like, that's it. Because this whole climb to be the person at the top of the chain and do the stuff, like no matter what it is you get to the top of, it's a very short-lived few moments. It's an hour on a stage. It's you in a podcast. It's someone giving you an award. Then you're right back home, you know, down the street, walking into the coffee shop to get coffee and nobody knows you. Or in the airport, right after that award, nobody knows you. And so if you're shooting for that high, you're going to be very let down when you get to the top and see that's just that. Doesn't mean you don't go after it. It means that when you go after, you have a peace of mind of understanding what that really looks like and what actually matters. So I'm out in this you know, area of Japan walking around. I'm like, it's cool that I could be with my kids and my wife, my mother-in-law and pay for this cool trip for her to go on all from the kind of experience and taste the food and be in the culture and then just be human on a planet. You know, I think that is the aha for me is it's just like that. That is the reality of it. Can I, can, and then when I go back to the work I do, I go, okay, great. So can I give that to people? Right. It's not about the big pizzazz. Right. Right. It's like all the stuff you work towards the build to is to create these moments where you can, because I, here's the thing I'm financially at peace, time wise, I'm at peace, health wise, I'm at peace, relationship wise, I'm at peace with my wife and my kids. There's no dark clouds hanging over my life anywhere. And that took a lot of freaking work. Like, okay, that run took off a lot for me. Of run work. off for me. You just mentioned money. You mentioned uh, health. 
You mentioned relationship yeah. with your wife, all these pieces. What's the runoff, the opposite of what those were for you? So we understand how far yeah. you've come. I've, I mean, I grew up poor, broke, meaning like I had to, like I had to actually my first year of football, I had to buy, I paid my own first year because my mom could afford, I had to get a paper route. I bought cleats, two sizes, too big. I taped paper, like toilet paper and cut it to the shape of my toe and put it inside the cleats. My feet would fit, right? We were the kids that got bags from the donation piles. Like we would take those home and wear them. So we didn't have money, right? That was the one thing to it. And so growing up, like that money wasn't this thing that was some you could get. It was so hard. And then so like having that peace of mind. And even now I, I make such a good income that like I live well below my means that it's like, I don't have to stress off bills being paid or, or having a future financial. Like it's actually really, it's alleviating, but that doesn't mean I'm, I'm all of a sudden happy because I could be rich with a horrible marriage and out of shape. And right. I could be a whole busted body. So I have that piece of the pie in a peaceful place. I'm not a billionaire, but I'm good. The relationship, I, my wife and I were divorced for three years. I hated her guts, like a whole bunch of custody <laughs> battle craziness. <laughs> Hold on. I like everyone yeah. listening is like, wait, what, what? Yeah. You we, were divorced we were from your sweethearts. wife. That's what they're all thinking right now. Yeah. High school sweethearts through high school, had a kid in college, 20 years old, had two more kids after college in the NFL, actually after the NFL. And then she had an affair. It broke my soul. I was suicidal at one point. Like life was horrible. It was like this, I call it the dark times. It was just a very dark three years of my life. And it was, there was no light there, man. It was just ugly and it was difficult. And I would try to find things that fill the gap and none of it worked. And that took a lot of growth for me and for her to eventually come back and be remarried in a very peaceful seven years deep remarriage. Like that's good. Uh, the ability for me to have my health, like I can move and still go play flag football and run around. Like there's something to be able to, we just walked on matter of fact, day three, I walked 27,000 steps in a day. My feet were fine. I got up the next day, did it again. Like that is like, you imagine how much I didn't, if you can't do that, how much I would have missed of life, you know, like seeing things and going places, climbing hills. Like there's so much of an actual physical view I would have missed that wouldn't be in my mind right now. So, and even the moments shared with the people that could do it with me, my kids and my wife, right? That health piece is a big piece of experiencing life. The relationships with my children. Like I, my kids, I have a great relationship. I love them. They love me. We can communicate, joke, go back and forth. Like genuinely, I know them, right? Because I can spend time with them every day, partially because of the income that I make, right? There's a piece there. It's just all these little nuances that, like, it's hard to be a parent, man. It's hard to have a relationship, hard to spend time. I spend during the last six months of my life, every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, two hours a day with my youngest son who's still here at the house, my oldest stuff in college, training him and his buddies. So I'm with him six hours a week. And most people don't get like six minutes with their kids. All these things come to pass. And so when I say I got to go out there and really breathe it in and think about what I do in the world, I am a living example of what I think if you got to settle it and experience that for a week, like you go, this is it. That's the top of the mountain, man. Like even if I go somewhere and do something and I'm on a stage, right? It's so short lived that people just go back to their lives and not worried about you, right? But, and what I can create, my kids were about me. I were about my kids. I get to see them do stuff and celebrate like it's cool, but I get to live a life that is like, it feels full. It's hard to explain like it just feels like it's robust. Like my life is just full of this cool friendships and a business that serves and like a great relationship. Like, but it's like this bursting, like it almost feels like it's too good to be true kind of thing. And so when I go, I question like, why am I working so hard? I think I'm working hard to one, sustain that, right? Because that if you don't work at that, that goes away. But then two, I go, God, if I believe you can't teach someone how to run the race until you've crossed some finish lines, I've crossed some cool finish lines, man. So now I'm going, how can I get other people to cross this finish line too? They're running the race and going backwards and left and right. Like, but I see the path. If I can get you to come here and you can experience a similar thing, then I can get that to you. Like, oh man, it's even better. Because the next level is like, can I get to that full feeling of giving that to other people as much as I can? So the work that I do, I'm trying to add that as a staple of like the busting at the seams feeling of like having people come and go, Anthony, thank you so much. I got this speech where I fixed my marriage and my life is great. Like that's the next level of success for me, I think is how much can I pass this whole experience of my life onto those who might desire something similar. So I, I have to imagine anyone who's just heard like the way you described it, I go like, that sounds like you're one lucky bastard or it sounds too good to be true or it yeah. sounds like, you know, you must have had rich parents, which I know you didn't because the foster care system, 
or, you know, like, well, you must just be sitting on football money um, mm-hmm. or something. And so yeah. th- there must have been some order that led to like, because because we know the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. We know those who have more can do more and yeah. take bigger risks. And there's, so there is this compounding effect. There Very is. much so. Like, like I talked to other entrepreneurs about, you know, the fact that on, successful entrepreneurs seem to be healthy. Well, does getting healthy make you more successful or does being successful make you want to get more healthy? Like, like which is the order? And, yeah. and the more oh, yeah. successful you are and the more healthy you are, the more confident you feel, the easier opportunities come to you, the more money you have, the less stress you have, the better your sleep is. Suddenly you can yeah. show up better. Like there's this huge compounding effect to all of these things you're talking about. Yeah. So like what, have you ever thought back about the order that you knock these things out? 100%. I have to do it every day. So th- there's a statement that I've, I've fallen in love with even more that I think about it. It's like, I don't believe you can attain or sustain a dream or a vision above your current identity. So there's a dream we have up here. And if you get to it, you're going to lose it. If your identity doesn't match and people go, what does that mean? I go, well, your identity is an expression through actions and habits and statements of who you are. And so if you want to have what this person up here has, you have to do actionably, habit-wise, thought-wise, what they do or else you're never going to get there, right? So if I go, man, I really want to be a race car driver, but I go, but I don't identify with um, getting in a car. Let's, Jeff, let's use Jeff about? Gordon, my favorite NASCAR there you driver. Go. Like, all like, all he's retired like now, but... Yeah, if I want to be like Jeff Gordon, and I, but you know what? I don't identify with getting in a car. I don't identify with gas vehicles. Like, well, what are you talking about? Like, then you can't have that. You can't have that, right? So it seems like you hear it and go, oh, that makes sense. But then when we start looking at people's lives, they go, I want to have more money. I want to have whatever it is. We'll call it separately from how crystal clear vision should be. It's a whole discussion separately. But like, say you want to have that thing, you know what it is, but you want to identify with the stuff and you go, well, well, no, I will. I go, well, then why are there certain things you haven't done yet that you know you're supposed to do? You're supposed to read that book, supposed to go to the gym at that day, eat that food, not eat that food. And so because of that, the dream will always be at arm's reach, never there. And then you go, well, how do you get that and compound what comes first? I go, well, if I already laid it out, I said, well, there's actions and habits and thought processes. Well, those are what are expressed by that identity. It has it. All we have to do is build up to it. So what you do is you take the small individual steps of the actions and the habits, and they're going to feel immediately out of character. The moment you do, you're like, oh, that's I'm not the guy that cold calls people. I don't go to the gym and work out. I don't say this on social media. That's great, right? That's not going to be your art, but I'm just telling you that's the steps and the direction of it. And when you say compound, it's like eventually, yeah, you do it the first day. It's weird. Second day, it's weird. In fact, I didn't see myself as a speaker for a lot of years. And I ended up doing this thing called a nightly 90. I did it for 1,333 straight days. It ends up being 3.65 years, not missing a day, every day, 3.65 years. A 90 second video filmed on my phone, posted in seven different platforms. And the first day felt really wonky. Like it was, oh, right? Second day felt weird. It was, I think, three months of like, why am I doing this? No one's watching it. I just kept doing it. And then eventually got to the point where like a year in, I'm like, I can't go to bed and not do this. It's just who I am to do this now. And then after that, it became what I call effortless effort. It was just, I was spitting these things out. I got to three and a half years of like, I was like, you know what? It's time to move to something new. I need a better challenge was my thing because I got so normalized to it by doing the small things every day that it was like, it was easy. Now I do a seven minute a day podcast, Monday through Friday, right? So I progressed to doing more. And the idea is like, even that was the same thing. I was like, this is awkward. Seven minutes of just talking to the screen, like what's going on? But you build. And so every step, as small as that seems, here's what came of that. I start talking. I start getting better at clarity of thought and it was called extemporaneous speaking like I'm doing now. I just talk off the cuff. I got better at the skill set. I felt more confident applying for stages. I felt better in, in the ideas of what I had because I'd spent time solidifying the ideas. I got better at the skill set of speaking. So when I got on stage, I did a better job so I, I could charge more. And the more I charged, the more I go, I could charge more. And the more I got feedback and just it all kept growing. And so people look at me and go, oh, you're a great speaker. I'm in the top you know, 1% financial speakers nationwide. And I go, how did it happen? I go, I just I started doing something for 90 seconds a day. And the beginning, I didn't feel like it. I didn't identify with it. It was this weird thing, but it compounds and it compounds. And that's the pathway. But most people aren't willing to do that 90 seconds a day. They want to wake up and be, I want to be good right now. I go, it doesn't start that way, man. But if you do it in the beginning, and, you, and I, I, I tell people all the time, do not go big. Go small in a very big way. 
choose a singular small thing and commit to doing it like all hell will break loose if you don't. And what's crazy is for the first couple of weeks, it'll be hard. First couple of months, it'll be hard. But eventually, it'll just be who you are to do it. That's the dark work. The stuff you do that's not sexy, not seen, it's misunderstood. People might ridicule you. Like I've made fun of for posting videos. What are you doing? Hey, you're a gym owner, bro. What are you posting videos for talking about life, right? This was statements. I had my best friend and my wife one time go like, that's not a real job. Speaking is not a real job. What are you talking about? Like, I'm like, yeah, it is, you know, but I did it. And the more you do it, the more you have to like you battle, but eventually it gets to the point of like, I've done too much work in the dark to lose in the light. I've just done, I've done too much to not keep shining brighter and brighter. And the pathway to anybody's future identity that they want to attain or sustain is a very similar collection of actions, habits, and mentalities. And you have to exercise them in the immediate moments, not feeling comfortable. But the more you do it, you'll eventually feel uncomfortable not doing it. You know, we've done this big shift on the podcast here from We Do Hard Things to The Mark Drager Show. And for a long time, on uh, we post to YouTube and we post to all of the audio platforms. Yeah. And the audio platform, I have way more fun with <laughs> because it's just like a little slower. It's a little more chill. I feel like it's my community. Yeah. Um, nothing against you YouTubers if you're watching this on YouTube. Love you guys too. Uh, but the audio platform, I have more time for openings and I've always wanted to like shift it up. Like for like six months now, I've talked to my yeah. producer and I've talked to my team. And, and so finally yesterday, you know, in my head, because I'm a bit of a breakfast in my head, I'm like, okay, I'm going to spend time watching all these other things and I'm going to write a script and I'm going to come up with something perfect. And it's going to like, yeah. I'm going to have my blocks and I'm going to have my segments. And I'm going to tell my team to do music and all of this stuff. And I just never had time. Like, I just never had time to do that. So finally, I'm like, okay, well, we've made the shift. We're doing the change. It's going. And, it, you know, what is what a three minute opening? I think it took me like 35 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. it was so choppy and I don't even know if it was good or not. And so yeah. I, I said to my team, I was like, okay, like let's clean it up. Let's cut it together. Um, listen to all my notes and then give me a transcription because um, it's just like, even if you ask me to, to do it again or to even make it better, I'm not even sure what I did. It was so bad that I'm <laughs> not even sure what my team is going to come up with. Yeah. A little behind the scenes here, guys. Um, and so I'm like, I need you guys to give me a transcription. So next week I can look at what I did and like make it better. Yeah. Um, and so I hear what you're saying with how uncomfortable it is. Um, but all I always tell myself is like, thank goodness no one's watching. Like I know people are, but I know that every time I get better, the audience will get bigger. Every time, <laughs> year by year, everything will get bigger. Mm -hmm. So even though right now it feels big, in a year or two, it'll be even bigger. So yeah. I had you on my podcast. You've been on the podcast on the first time we met. I think it was like episode maybe 8 or 10 or 12. Mm -hmm. uh, audience, it was Anthony was fantastic. Uh, I think I was okay. Don't go back and watch it. Don't go back and listen, please. <laughs> but, you know, all I think about is like, oof, we got to get forward with it. It is uncomfortable. Uh, but I guess we got to do it, right? Like, we don't have a choice. Yeah. I mean, that's not that you don't have a choice. It's, and again, I think it's, it, it gets uncomfortable. It will be at first. But then I think the idea is like when you close the day and you look back at it, you got to choose. Do I identify with the outcome? Because if I identify the outcome, I'll tell myself every day you suck. But if I identify with the effort, I go, hey, bro, valiant effort today. Here's where it all came from for me was football. It's as much as they think we're dumb jocks, there's a lot of psychology going on here. Here's what it means. I would go out and I'm one of the best in the world, right? One of the, literally the best in the world at my sport. And I would go out there and I'd do my practice. And I would come into the weight room or sorry, come into the film room after practice or after games. And they put you up on the screen and go, let's watch your plays. And oh my goodness, they chop everything up. Your feet in the wrong place. They make fun of you. The room's laughing. The whole, they, right? So and then, hold right. on, it's the whole team watching. Well, it depends. All yeah. It's like special teams. Yeah, you have the whole team watch you mess up or get beat by somebody else. Like it happens, right? So, the, but the thing is, when you leave that room, you don't go, I'm done with football. You go, okay, I see an opportunity where I can improve. It sucked to hear it, but let's go back to work, right? And so when you start identifying with a person that is willing, to go and give his absolute best in the moment. It's time to give the, your energy, knowing you will go back later on and find areas of improvement. If, the, if you're okay with that, you fall in love with the efforts. You fall in love with trying to find some area to improve. I want to find that hole. And it's like, you almost appreciate the feedback and you like to get chopped up because you know how well you can come back from it because you know you're willing to do the work. 
those who aren't willing to do the work, the moment they try something and the coach says, oh, you didn't do this right, they quit the game. That's what happens with a lot of people. They just quit the game. Now, quitting the game could mean no more podcasts, no more YouTube videos or TikTok videos. Um, it could mean no more trying the new job, no more business at all, just have a job forever. That's, it could look like a bunch of different things in your life. But the idea is if you don't go out there and go, okay, look, I know I'm not great at this, but I'm going to give my absolute best effort and I'm going to find out where I can improve and improve. If that can be your mentality, you will be great. That's just it. When you can fall in love with the process of getting great as opposed to just being great, that's where greatness becomes your reality. So how do you raise your standards then? Because you've spoken, I feel like we're kind of swimming a bit around this. I got my in-laws coming to, to watch the kids because Jack and I are taking off. And every time that, that they, because they travel a lot and they're out a lot, mm-hmm. they don't live in our city. Every time they come over, I kind of clean up the house a bit. <laughs> and yeah. I look around and go, oh man, too. that box, I think it was sitting there last time they were here. Yeah. And if that box is still sitting here three months later, they're going to know that like, like it to me, it becomes suddenly unacceptable. It's no longer like this box of tools was just yeah. temporarily there because three months ago it was there and now it's still here. So I always end up looking at my house and my home and everything and like with outsider's eyes, with fresh eyes. You ever go to someone else's house to their bathroom and you see the dust on the... Um, on the uh, on the yeah, on the a, sill or something, and you're like, "Ooh, someone else's dust." And then you come to your house, and you don't even notice like yeah, your bathrooms well, and stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's a weird thing. So like, so like, sometimes we get so used to our environment, we get so used to yeah. work and our processes and our culture and the way we think and all of these things. Like, yeah. and then sometimes you have to like work to raise your standards, don't you? Yeah, or you can choose someone who stands or higher, and you don't have to like try to find them. Because I think the interesting thing about us as humans is we are in complete viewpoint, even now more than ever, of other individuals who might have what we want to attain or sustain. And if we were to ask ourselves what that person would do, we'd get an answer that is going to be opposite of what our actions would typically be, or at least on the same direction, right? And so what I do is I actually look at who the people that I aspire to be in that certain area of my life. And I go, if I had that person step into my life and take a look, what would they say? I literally say, if your hero followed you around for a day, what would they say? Ooh, right. Ooh. I'm and glad so, some of my friends uh, live in California and the UK and super far away because I'm. I wonder if they would be less impressed with me if they hung out with me, you yeah. know, like in way more detail. <laughs> I don't know. I, that's a good question. I think I have. I've had a lot of people hang out with me and go like, "Dude, you're really the same." I'm like, "Yeah, I'm 100 percent the same." I had a guy fly from Florida to come hang out at my house. We did a podcast. We're out with the kids, and I was like, "This is, it's just." Hold on, hold on. Can we do that? Listeners, can we all just show up at Trucks' house? I mean, you can. I mean, I'm not going to let you in, but you can come. I mean, a lot of people are not coming to the house. <laughs> you can stand on the street. You can look at his neighbor, who this mystery yeah. neighbor who never shows up at the house or anything. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's... Yeah. I also don't try to paint this big picture of who I am. I tell people, dude, I'm a regular guy with an irregular skill set and desire to help people. That's it. Like, and, I, and it's not to downgrade or downplay because some people go around like, why do you, but you're so great at this. And I go, I know I'm great at this, but I'm also not great at a lot of things in the rest of the world. I'm not the greatest in the world. It doesn't mean don't admire what I'm doing. It just means understand the position of what it is, understand what it actually is, right? It's not, I'm not changing and saving the entire world, just my world or those who aspire to have a similar world. And that's going to be a sub-segment of the earth, right? So there's that piece to it. But I think that there is something too, like, I will tell you this, there's somebody that hang out with me. And it, this is one that's not fun to hear for a lot of folks. Separate me from this conversation. Think about the individual that you love the most. Let's think about a Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant, Serena Williams, uh, Tom Brady. Most people go, oh man, I'm a fan. I like this. That's so great. He's my hero. I want to go hang out with him. I'm going to tell you right now, no, you don't. And they go, what do you mean I want to hang out with him? Because you don't function at that man and woman's level. Which means if you got around them, your mediocrity would sicken them. They wouldn't spend time with you or they would spend very minimal time. And it would drain them because they don't know how to deal with people who don't have a mentality at that level. And so when we all look at people and you go like, oh, I want to have that. And be, you don't grasp fully like they may not like you as a human. There's a reason you know of them and you're a fan of them because the level they tick and they operate. They may not like you. And so people go like, I'd never meet your heroes. Yeah, I know why they say never meet your heroes because they let you down. They're not because they're, they're being people. You just aren't their level, dude, or you'd be in that locker room with them, you know? And so people don't want to accept and embrace that, but that's a true reality. Now, I, I think you can put it in whatever you want language-wise for it, but if you can understand that and be okay with that, 
then you'll have a better life, I think. But also it's like that can also inform you of areas for you to improve. And like you said, how do I know how to improve? Well, you can get other people to tell you, like ask people, hey, like, how can I improve? Or look at yourself in comparison to people that you admire. And if you ask yourself, would that person do that? And the answer is no, then don't do that thing. <laughs> and if they would do that thing, and that's the simplest it can be. It's going to feel weird. Like I said before, it's going to feel awkward. The more you do it, the more it becomes who you are, the more you become like them. Keep saying do that, you know, the actions. I was, I guess, always um, under the belief that there was this like, you know, you have to think things and then believe things and then beliefs lead to confidence and then confidence leads to like, there's all these fancy frameworks out there. Yes, loops. But it sounds like it's just like, just do it. <laughs> no, it does. There actually is. There's like a, there's an identity loop. I call it the identity loop. And what it is like, you have a way you identify right now that fuels certain beliefs you have. These beliefs fuel thoughts. The thoughts fuel your emotions, how you feel. The emotions fuel your actions. Your actions create the outcomes. The outcomes give you a sense of the environment externally and internally of how you feel and who you are. And that anchors back to your identity. So if I, See, go, I knew I, there was a framework. <laughs> yeah, there is. But here, but most people go, what's well, a loop? It's always spinning, right? If I identify with the guy who's a, if I identify as a crappy podcaster, right? That I believe I'm sucking at podcasts. I go, man, you suck at podcasts. And my energy is like, yeah, you do suck at podcasts. So my energy in a podcast, the action is horrible. Therefore, the outcome is a bad podcast. And I go, see, I'm a sucky podcast. No one downloaded, nobody listened. And I go, see, identify as a bad podcast. It's just a loop. And people go, well, how do you change a loop? The only way I've seen people change loop because you can't just change a belief overnight or a thought overnight. You can try it. It's not a hundred percent. You need to have that thing be rooted because we have what's called cognitive dissonance. You know when you're lying to yourself. So how do you do it? Well, there's a space that we've all done something that most people don't think to, but it's a space where it's called an unconfident action. It's an unconfident, bold action. We've all done some where like as a kid, we would jumped off a cliff or said that thing or asked the girl for a phone number back as a kid, right? You took this super unconfident leap with bold action, like it almost like a disassociation from who you saw yourself to be in that singular moment. And it created a different outcome. The outcome gives you this like, oh, wait, maybe I can, right? Internal, external environment, maybe I can. Then it shakes up the identity anchorage you have and it loosens it. But the concrete of you go, maybe it's, not only who I am, maybe I believe because of this experience, this outcome, I can do more. So your beliefs change a little bit. Thoughts change a little bit. The emotion change a little bit. Now the action is a little bit different and it goes up and up. So for all of us sitting here going, well, how do I break free? You have to take some super uncomfortable, bold actions. And those are outlined for you by people you've already seen doing what you want to do. You came up with this. So we talked about dark work, the work you have to do. In the darkness, it's the unsexy, the unglamorous work. So that way, when you, later, you know, you come out and you're ready to perform in the light in front of people or whatnot, like you're ready. You've yeah. done the work. And on top of that, you built the confidence, you built the skill set and, and people um, like you have this like fuel or whatever, where it's like, I've worked too hard for you to beat me kind of thing. Yeah. Um, how did you find this in your life? Where did this come from? Oh, man, it came from me at 15 years old. And then, it, and then it happened over and over again. I didn't notice that I was like 35 years old, to be honest. <laughs> it was <laughs> so, a weird so, so 20 years of research and development. <laughs> yeah, without knowing I was researching or developing. Yeah, 100%. I just, uh, I, you know, at 15, I had this moment where I was like, I want to be a great football player. And, and the thing was, I didn't know how to. So I was like, well, who's a great football player? So I started watching Jerry Rice and the guys in my area, the San Francisco 49ers. And I go, okay, well, they do these things. Like they go catch a football every day. I was like, but I don't do that. I guess they got to do it, you know? What else they do? Well, they're big and strong. I'm like, oh, shoot, I'm not big and strong. I'm skinny and weak. And what do they do? They go to the weight room. Like, I don't go to the weight room, but I guess if I want to be great like them, I got to go do those things, right? So it informed me of what I had to do. So I started doing it. And it feels super uncomfortable. You're weak, you're skinny, you can't catch a football. And most people go, I'm done with this. It's too hard, right? Whereas for me, I go, well, I guess I, guess I got to keep doing it because that's the only way to get there. Logic told me, and I go, what's the opposite? What if I stop doing this? Well, then I'm not going to end up there. It's just simple logic. If I don't do this, I don't end up there. If I do this, I end up over there. So I go, well, I don't want to go there. So I kept doing it. And you do meet the, the aspects of it's uncomfortable, it's unsexy. People don't make sense of it. Like your teammates, like trucks, you suck. Why are you doing that? Right. So I got these people ridiculing me as, as well as not getting what I'm doing. And so I'm just still doing it because I'm yeah, really that's some one thing I don't understand. People going like, Hey, you suck at this thing. Why are you spending time doing it? And like, 
so I can get better at it, right? Like, no, like does yeah. it make sense? <laughs> I think there's two reasons. I think one is because people are being, you're a mirror to them of what they're not doing. So they don't want to have you, you know, look that way, make them look bad. So they got to bring you back down to their size, right? And then two, I think it, it's because it's such an abnormal thing that people don't like abnormal and they point it out. And especially if it's outside the normal box that they've placed you in, because a lot of us in life, people know who we are. And they notice when you step out of the who you are and they let you know. Like if a woman wants to start singing or lose weight or a guy wants to go and get muscles, whatever it is, whoever your normal group is that had you in that box of knowing who you are, the moment you're doing something outside of your character, they're like, oh, that's weird. And all they can say is like, what are you doing? Oh, they make jokes and make fun of it. And that's just the natural thing I think about us as humans, unfortunately. But you just have to keep pushing. So I did that at 15 and eventually came out on the other side of seven months of doing this, which was my first dark work experience, I'd call it. And it was just this different human that emerged just wasn't this it was not the same guy like physically i was a little bit better i definitely had some better fine you know fine motor skills but the identity of me and what i was not willing to to not we'll call it get as the in the return of my investment you know because that's what that meant i've done too much work in the dark it's this return and investment i've already paid the price for this i'm not about to not collect right so i've caught football 500 times a day that's my football now. I don't care who you are. It's mine. You didn't do what I did. Why would I let you take what's mine when you didn't do what I did or pay what I paid? That's the thing. And so a lot of people, they want to withdraw and get the money from the ATM without having ever put it in the actual bank. And that's mm-hmm. all that we're talking about here. For mm-hmm. me, I go, let's start filling that bank up and you can start withdrawing whatever you want. And if you maintain that effort and that flow, because it's who you are, then the well never runs dry. That is so good. That is so good, man. Um, you know, one thing I say to myself, my my little cue that I give myself is runners got to run. Because, you know, I was overweight and um, I was never really great at running and I've fallen in love with it and I've gotten better at it. But I go through these seasons where like through the winter out here, I didn't do any outdoor running. I still run two or three miles a day at the gym. Yeah. But I like outdoor running. And then, you know, summer or spring comes along and it's like, oh, it's time to go out for a 10K on a Sunday which I love, but it, like, I'm a little nervous, you know, like I haven't done it in a while. I'm a little nervous yeah. about it. I'm a little worried about it. And then I just, I'm always like, well, if I want to be a runner, then I have to go out and run, right? Like, this. like it's the most obvious thing in the world right. where it's like, you know, whatever you want to be, if you want to be a painter, you better okay. have paintbrushes and spend time painting, right? Like, <laughs> and I say, if you spend like 10 minutes a day doing this thing over a year, you're going to be better than what 90% of the people doing it. I just heard this somewhere. Then like a Jesse Itzler video or something he talked about. That's it. That's the separation, but people won't do the actions. That's where I keep saying, just go do it. And it's, people are like, well, I gotta wait for the perfect time. No, you don't. Cause your life is not set up for that right now. Cause it's not who you are. So make a time. It's going to feel imperfect. That's what it's going to feel like. So you're not going to have time. It's not gonna be the right moment. It's just, it's never going to happen. Never because your brain doesn't know what it's like to fit that in. So you just, fit it in and you realize, oh, wait, I can do this and I can do more and you expand. I think so much of what we need to do as humans is stop looking at what I want, how hard it is and just go, what if I just started something simple? Just to start making a deposit, just to start putting some in the bank little by little, you'd be surprised at what accrues. Even if it's 30 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, give me that, right? Then at the end of a year, or shoot, at the end of a month, we'll call it, I got 15-ish hours of extra time in a discipline that you don't have. My son plays football. I tell him, son, you're going to get to high school next year. There's going to be kids that are going to be monsters out there. The only separation is not going to be whether or not you had a cool gym in your garage, whether or not you guys played in a cool team, had a good coach. It's the thousands of dark hours that you didn't see that kid put in. You're not battling him. You're battling his hours. If he spent 400 hours, a thousand hours, and you spent 200, you don't get to pull out of the bank the same thousand he has of time, of skill set, of experience, of fine motor patterning, of psychological understanding, of just sheer confidence. You don't get that. So your job is to match his hours and supersede his hours. That's how you inevitably win. That cut and dry. I love it. I've got to change gears a little bit here because I got to ask you about something that happened to you a few months ago. All right. So um, I was looking at the New York Times a few days ago, and there was an article on body positivity. So mm-hmm. Samantha Irby, who is the supervising producer 
of the newest episode, season of the Sex in the City right off as that it's okay to hate your body. You know, yeah. she is a, a very smart woman, uh, but she has, uh, I think, Crohn's disease. And so okay. she lives in a body that she's hated for her whole life because she's felt trapped in it. She mm-hmm. hasn't liked it. She doesn't yeah. enjoy it. And she doesn't understand why there's this sudden movement where everybody has to just love themselves. Now, I know you were on Impact Theory with Tom Bilyeu, yeah, and you, you kind of spoke a little bit about this and yeah, it I blew up because yeah, you got in trouble for saying something <laughs> along the lines of what Samantha Irby is saying. This so, is true though, man. Gee, I'm going to get in trouble again, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to get you in trouble. Do you see how I'm leading no. you there? The so first off, everyone deserves love to be loved. That's one thing. I want okay, to make Lucas, but, cut all of this stuff out. Hit me that. with the soundbite. <laughs> I'm going to say that. Just know you guys, that's the thing. Is There's a different sense of like love and acceptance. The other part of it is you, if you try to make yourself love something or like something you don't like, you're just going to battle yourself because your brain knows it's not okay. And then what happens is you just endure the situation you don't like being in and trying to figure out why your brain won't allow you to enjoy it. And the rest of the world tells you, you're okay as you are. You're great. And I go, oh, that's very debilitating. For me to go, I don't feel great, but you're saying I should feel great. Then I feel less than because I don't feel great. Is something wrong with me even more? Gosh, and you just get just compounds opposed to going, look, if you're a weak, skinny dude, you shouldn't be okay being weak and skinny. Go lift some weights, homie. It's okay. Like tell yourself you're weak. My wife, some of the things I tell her, like when I'm getting overweight, I'm like, tell me when I feel fat. She's like, she tells me, she's like, you feel a little tight here. You got luck. I feel, oh, you're a little bigger in the back there, right? Like she'll tell me. Now, it doesn't mean I hate myself. But if I don't dislike a certain part of something, I will not be energized to improve it. And for us to go body positivity, be okay being fat. There's a whole slew of things we could talk about. The physiological aspects, the lack of health. I don't see very many obese old people. That's just a simple one. So for me, I go, if we know that most people that are living until they're 90 plus, like they're in decent kind of physical body shape. Like that's not a good mixture. I go, okay, that we, we can't normalize. I'm okay being fat because it's not good for your health and for the loved ones during you. But also I grew up in a household with people that were obese and they, they tried every diet under the sun. And while we loved each other and I loved them, they didn't love their bodies. Like they weren't happy with it. They had, it's like a, they're always battling something. There's always like this tension, you know? And so to sit there and go, you're fine as you are. They didn't like they didn't like that. Like they didn't like having this body that felt like this and look, they didn't enjoy it. So just telling them to, to fall in love with it, it's like it's difficult. And so I, I watched that firsthand take place. And so I, when I look at this body positivity, I go, look, it's one thing to be positive about your body if there's certain things you can't change. I get it if you have birthmarks like a burn or some bro. That's one other thing. But for you to go, I have the ability to change this thing about me that I don't like. Why are we trying to just tell you to just be happy with it? Just be okay with it. When you're not okay with it, I should be going, look, you're not okay with it? Cool. Let's do some things to fix that. Because here's what happens to the backside nobody sees. When people go through that journey of like, you know, losing weight and feeling strong and powerful in your body, you're robbing them of that true positivity. That's real body. But I feel like, damn, I look good. Like, I feel good. I feel strong. I can run. Like, you're robbing people of that true moment and that true feeling when you give them this whole, I, you're okay being fat. Be like Lizzo. Like, what are we talking about? It's just weird to me when I go, there's nothing quite like being able to take 27,000 steps to the top of a shrine where you can look out and see Mount Fuji. You can't do that when you're obese. And so as much as you want to feel positive about your body, you rob yourself of life and the people around you, the life you get to live. Okay, let's get you in trouble. <laughs> let's get the message out to the world. Anthony Trucks, everyone. I totally agree with you. And it's only, I think the thing that we overlook is we don't realize how shitty we feel until we start to feel better. Yeah. So, you know, like um, a few, maybe a month and a half ago, I was really off of my diet. And, you know, mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm puffy and my 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 joints are swelling and I can't wear yeah. my wedding ring because it just makes me a bit uncomfortable. And I know I don't feel great, but I didn't realize how terrible I felt yeah. Until like I spend a week or two cleaning up my diet. And then yeah. suddenly I'm like, wow, like, good again. man, I've got like so much energy and I'm sleeping better and I'm like way more confident and um, I'm not feeling super lethargic in the middle of the day. And it's like, I'm feeling less lazy and I'm getting more stuff done, which means I'm worrying about less. And it's just like, 
oh, right. I was just up. eating too much shit, right? Like, just, just, I, I have a friend that's, like I always say, like, just stop eating shit. Yeah. It's just called stop. quality of life. There's a reason we call it, like, if you go to the fitness realm, it was always about quality of life. Improve your quality of life. It was it was something where like when you you were in the moment you didn't really get it but like now having watched life and I get it like there's a definite quality of life that is different experiential like you're talking to the way you feel the way you interact the way you're seen the way you're accepted when you've done that and the cool thing is to fall over the process you don't got to be in crazy ripped abs I'm not even a six pack ripped abs shape by any you means you just finished seventy five hard right I did and I feel good like I, yeah that, that thing is for me is I. Like, I know at the end of the day that I loved more of the process than like where I've arrived, but I love the experience of life I get to have. I like how I feel about myself. And like you're saying, if we just give the body positivity, love who you are, you're eliminating that amazing feeling from somebody's life. And in fact, you're putting in them a seed of doubt because they go, why don't I feel as good as they say I should? Why do I have to talk myself into feeling good about this when I don't feel? And like now it's just this internal voice. That's all. It's a conundrum. It doesn't have to be. It, it should, in fact, be the amazing, free feeling you're talking about. Yeah. And here's my hope, because this is actually... I don't know if these are two sides of the same coin or not, mm-hmm. but I definitely downplayed the things that I'm awesome at and wouldn't take credit for it, wouldn't recognize it, wouldn't own it, wouldn't yeah. have confidence to say, I am awesome at that. And I felt really crappy about a whole bunch of other things. And the more that I address the things that I don't like about myself either accepting that it's like, just let it go or working on it, the more confident I am actually to own the things that I'm really good at. Yeah. You know, and, and I say things now, not even in jest, not out of ego, but I say certain things that Jacqueline looks at me and she's just like, Mark, you can't say stuff like that. Like, you know, we were in Jamaica. (laughs) Yeah. It sounds like every wife, right. But we're in Jamaica and we're doing a spin class and, um, and when and it, it was the spin instructor's birthday, I was like, "Happy birthday!" Like our my presence was your present. Yeah. And Jack's yeah. like, "You can't say that." And I was like, I "No, it. but I can tell you." I looked at the spin class. <laughs> I looked at the people who were there. <laughs> yeah. I know that me being in the spin class made that instructor's experience way better. I get it because I, I pushed and I was fun and I was chitty chatting with her and we took a selfie afterwards. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, my presence was a present to her. <laughs> yeah, I get it. I do the same thing. I did my kids. They, they say stuff and I go, Tatum, isn't it crazy? Your dad is so sexy. Golly, how do you deal with that with your friend? Like just mess around. But like you play and it's, <laughs> it's not and I, like it's like a complete joke, you know, but there's also that part that you can expand and express and do it in a non arrogant way. Because it doesn't mean that because I'm in good shape and I feel good about myself that you have to feel less. It's more of like, a, let's do this. You, know, you feel like you want to bring people up to that. And it's an inviting more than like a casting out. And I think that's where I think the body positivity thing is. They see all the comments about how they feels like this, where I'm casting them out. We're like we're not casting you out. Like my family, I had a gym for a lot of years. I begged them to come to the gym. Please come. Let me help you. Like, please. And they just didn't want to come. It was their own decision not to come. But like, I wasn't in any way being like, oh, you're like, I hate when people post pictures of an like out of shape person at the gym not doing well. It sickens me. Do you oh, know they're, they're showing up. They're trying. Yeah. You know what they had to do to get themselves to a level of comfort to put themselves in that? Oh my goodness. I want to come like break these people's faces when they do this kind of stuff. Cause that person's on a damn journey. And I, I love seeing that. Yeah. And so like, I want to give that to people but you have to be that to give that. So how did, how do you deal with the, um, you know, you talked about your family. Yeah. I, and I don't imagine, you know, your foster dad or your mom or your, or any of them, like they're not watching this episode of this podcast or everything no, you're on, no. but you know, Bill, you know, your friend Tom too, he yeah. talks about his family, um, similar background and, and you yeah. guys speak in just such absolutes that it's like, um, doesn't that like, aren't you worried about pissing them off? <laughs> No, I mean, I, I, well, I've had these conversations openly with my family. I talk, I mean, my little brother comes to our house and he works out. Like I tell him, all the time, he's down a whole bunch of weight. Thankfully, it took a bad breakup to have it happen. But I, I think there's a part of me where people go like, it's, it's tough. Because just so, sorry, just so people understand, right? Like you were in the foster care system. So this is yeah. like your foster family. Yeah. For, you're, for anyone listening, you're a black man. This is a white family, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. So like, it's different, and, and then yeah. you went off to become a professional athlete yeah. and they're not. So, so yeah. you're a very different man compared to some compared of the people in your family. Group. Yeah. But they know I love them. I think that's why I have relationships with them. But at the same token, there's a part of me that like, I've always been inviting to it. 
And I think when I do talk about it openly and publicly, like I, I talk about it in a way, cause it's, that's reality. I think that there's thought of people going like, you want to, you know, don't make somebody feel bad. I'm like, no, we should make people feel bad. Cause sometimes you feeling bad is the catalyst to you being great. Right. The whole idea of like, uh, this is going to sound bad. There's a guy that has t-shirts as they do Gomez on Instagram. It says, bring back bullying. Now there are levels of bullying that are bad because they take it to levels where people actually take their lives. And that I obviously have no, def- no respect for, but there, when you were a kid, if you were like, Hey bro, you stink, homie, take a shower. You know, like as a kid, like that was, oh, now it's bullying. This is my choice to define as a stinky kid. Like, no bro, go wash your body. You know, there's certain <laughs> levels of where bullying, if they, we call it really is like necessary. And so whenever I talk about these things, I think that there's this tough love people call. And I go, I don't know if we should call it tough love. It's just love. Like, I love you enough to tell you the truth, even if you won't like to hear it from me, you might get mad at me, right? Because I love you, I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. If I don't love you, I just want to pacify the situation. I don't say anything to you. I let you keep enduring that. Like, what kind of person loves somebody and lets them keep enduring this pain without like telling them like, hey... You got, you know, this thing going on. There's some toilet paper stuck hanging out of your butt, bro. That's why you keep getting made fun of. Can you take toilet paper out of your butt? I love you enough to tell you, right? Or there's food on your teeth. Like, I hate when people don't say something about someone's food in their teeth. Like, bro, you're looking at their face. Tell them it's on their <laughs> teeth. And so like, these little things, I go, it's not tough love. It's well, What I, about the Bible, right? You got a plank in your eye. Don't say anything because... You know, no? Yeah, just so for me, I just, with my family, I just, I stayed it. Now, again, there's no making fun of them. It's like there's an awareness of the desire to get in greater shape. My sisters have all, they've recently gotten great shape. My little brothers get in good shape and I love it. I love celebrating that. And even if they listen to the podcast, they wouldn't listen to it and go, he doesn't like me. He doesn't love me. I love them enough to tell them what, what should be said, what should be talked about. Because... I think people nowadays in society, there's so much of us skewing towards the easy, the less stress shouldn't be so hard that we're finding ways to make all of society not have to experience difficulty. And so the Uber, you know, the Uber eats to your house, it's all so easy. So it's like, well, shouldn't everything be easy? Yeah. Well, then maybe if working out's hard, then, um, you know, it's probably, it's not easy. Then we shouldn't work out. Well, if we don't work out, we get big. Let's just be okay with that. Let's be okay with that. Yeah, okay, let's do Let's be okay with that because it's easy. Like, that's what happens, I think, in my head. I even think, oh, no, we're not going to go there. Anyways. <laughs> Whoa, we just watched Anthony catch himself. <laughs> yeah, there's a tangent there. I, 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 I even I, think, Dot, listeners, you yeah. guys, question of the week. Yeah, I, I do a question of the week every week. Go ahead and leave a comment below or send me an, a, a DM at Instagram at Mark.Drager. Here's the question of the week. What do you think Anthony was going to say? That's yeah. the question of the week. <laughs> That's the whole, I'll tell you afterwards off. Uh, that's a thought that's still cooking. I don't know if that one can get out to the world just yet, but I oh think there's goodness. something about our society skewing towards and appeasing the weakness within us, which doesn't make us a strong society, strong humans and weak humans are unhappy humans. We feel helpless and hopeless. We're scared because we're weak. And I think if we get our strength back to a certain level in multiple areas, we find there's more joy and more control because you can be, you can be you. Even if it's just strong enough to be yourself, right? There's something within that, that if we don't build the muscle, we don't have the ability to lift life. 